Father God, we thank you so much, uh, Father God, that you have you have just made a way for us through your Son Jesus Christ, Father God. We are so thankful for that. And Father, we celebrated uh, the birth of your Son yesterday, Father, and um, to keep that our main focus, Father God, is our heart's desire to take that with us throughout the year, Father God. That, that Jesus came wrapped in flesh, fully God and fully man, to experience everything that we experience, but yet without sin, to be the perfect lamb for us, to take away our sins, Father. We thank you so much for that. And Father, we come this morning um, just with humble hearts, anxious to hear what you have to say to us through Pastor Randy this morning, Father God. I pray that you would soften our hearts and ready us for your word, Father God, that we would take it in and apply it to our lives, Father God, that we would be able to walk in your ways. Father, we ask that you would help us today to be more like your son, Jesus. Father, we want to lift up Brother Bill to you and ask for just a divine intervention with his health, Father God. We pray that you would be with him, comfort him, and give him the strength that he needs to do everything that the doctors are asking him. And Father, we also know that there's others that are in our congregation who are now suffering, either themselves or family members uh, with cancer as well. So Father, we just lift them all up to you and ask for your healing touch, your healing hand, Father God. You are our great physician and we trust you, Father God. And Father, we ask this morning that you would be with Pastor Randy and with the praise team, Father God, as they take us into the throne room and as, as Pastor Randy brings the word to us, Father God, I just pray for a special anointing on you this morning. Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit to come this morning and dwell our praises this morning, Father God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, we recognize here, Lord, that we have received the greatest gift ever, ever known to man, Lord, Jesus Himself. Father, who willingly stepped down out of heaven, wrapped Himself in flesh, and dwelt amongst us, Lord. And who also willingly placed Himself on the cross, Lord, and bore our sins upon Himself and paid our debt there. God, we're thankful for the gift of Jesus. And Father, we know, God, that, that You are our provider, Jehovah Jireh, Lord, that you continually provide for our every need, Lord, and we are forever thankful for that. And God, we recognize that everything that we have is a gift from you, Lord. That everything, every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father of lights, Lord, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, Lord. Thank you. Father God, we pray, Lord, that today as we give our tithes and offerings, Lord, that you would bless it, multiply it. God, use it for your glory and your kingdom, Lord. Uh, God, you alone are worthy of our praise here this morning, God. And and we give it to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children next door for Children's Church. How are we doing this morning, church? Wonderful. Yeah. That's the response I like. This is a light group, but that's probably a better response than I normally get. So uh, I appreciate that this morning, guys. Um, like Nikki said, I mean, we had a long day yesterday. Started at well, like she said, about 5.30 and at about 10 o'clock, but it was a good day and we enjoyed it. Uh, but I was just reminded this Christmas season, like I shared for our Christmas Eve service, is, you know, Jesus is the reason, right? I mean, He is the reason we celebrate Christmas. Uh, and I'm deeply grateful for His willingness to do that, to come down to earth and, and be God incarnate, take on flesh and dwell amongst us and live a life that we could not live apart from Him, and provide an offering that would satisfy uh, the requirement of God uh, on our behalf and make a way that we might have eternal life through His sacrifice and His offerings. Amen. Amen. So church, we're going to be back in the book of Exodus this morning, so if you would, turn there with me. Exodus chapter 34, continuing our study and our following Israel out of their captivity in Egypt, through the wilderness, and now they're at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses had been up on the mountain for 40 days receiving the commandments of God, and, and during that time Israel became impatient, uh, and in their impatience they cried out to Aaron and said, Aaron, make us a God that, that we can follow, All right? Aaron made them that God by melting down all their golden ornaments and, and made for them a golden calf and they worshipped that calf and God sent Moses down off the mountain. Moses broke the commandments that were given, the tablets that were given to him and, and he rebuked Israel. Israel suffered a great consequence. Over 3,000 men were, were killed that day, and unrepentant men. Uh, but yet... Probably the greatest consequence that they faced was the possibility of God removing His presence from them. He had told Moses, he, you know, get up, leave, go, go to the promised land. I'll provide for you. I'll even send an angel before you. Uh, but I'm not going with you. Israel repented from that. They, uh, because of that, that news, they, that news, that, that idea... <laughs> They would have to go any further without God in their life, God in their presence. And, and Moses uh, interceded on their behalf and asked God for His mercy on them. God demonstrated His mercy by instructing Moses that, yes, Moses, I will go with you. My presence will go before you. Uh, last week we talked about how Moses, even though he knew that God would be with him, he wanted more, right? 
It wasn't good enough for Moses just to know that God would be with him. He wanted God to show himself and to reveal himself to Moses in a very personal and intimate way. And he did that. God instructed to him, whenever Moses cried out, you know, God, show me your glory, God's response to him was, you know, no man has seen my face and live, but I will pass before you. I will allow my goodness to pass before you. And I will place you in the cleft of this rock as I pass by, and you will see my goodness pass by. We talked about the importance of not just having a knowledge of God, but to know Him, right? The importance of having intimacy with the Lord. And then how that has been provided for us through Jesus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that He is our high priest and He has entered behind the veil and, and He has torn the veil, meaning that He has opened up access that you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, as believers, we can have an intimate relationship with God the Father. That's good news, church. Amen. You see, that's beyond religion and a list of things that we that we do to please God. I mean, what God is saying here is He's saying, I want you to know me intimately and personally. <clears throat> Moses would continue to seek the Lord. And we're going to see here in chapter 34 where the Lord visits with Moses one more time on Sinai. And He gives, <clears throat> He tells Moses to take tablets and that God says that I will write the commandments. And he wrote, God wrote the commandments on the tablets, and that's where we find them here today. And I, I want to look at verses 5 through 9. Maybe you'll have it up here on the screen this morning. But before we do that, I do want to take a moment just to pray. So if you would, bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful, God, for the ability, Lord, that we have to approach you boldly as the Scriptures teach us, Lord, because of Jesus. God, that we can come before you in faith and know, Lord, that you are the God of all comfort, as Paul would say in Corinthians. God, that you are the God, Lord, who brings us peace in our troubles and struggles, Lord. Father, knowing, Lord, that we can find our rest in you because Jesus is our Sabbath. Father, God, thank you. God, we thank you for your presence here with us today. Because we know, Lord, that your word also teaches us that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. There's no doubt in our minds and our hearts today, God, that you're here with us. God, we thankful, God, for the peace that that brings us in knowing, Lord, that you're willing, God, to be with us today. And I ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to you today, Lord. God, that we might have a clear understanding, God, of your character, your nature, Lord. God, of who you are. God, through the teaching and the preaching of your word. Father, I ask that you would set me aside, Lord, and use me as your vessel, Lord. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, and we pray that your spirit would lead us into all truth here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to begin by reading a couple of passages here and stop and talk to you about some things. What I'm hoping that we can leave here with today is a deeper understanding of God's character and His nature. But in the sense that, listen, God is unchanging. Okay, God does not change. In verses 5 and 6, God speaking to Moses says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. And I love how it says He stood with him there. As if God came down to visit with Moses and, and to step in in this situation with Moses. He said, Moses, I'm here with you. Right? I'm standing here in your presence. You know, Moses had cried out. God had seen the heart of Moses. When Moses cried out, God, show me your glory. You know, God, Moses' deepest desire was to know God in a more intimate, personal way than he had before. And he had experienced God on, on, on some pretty... Um, miraculous levels already, right? I mean, he has seen how God had miraculously delivered Israel from their captivity, their bondage in Egypt. Set them free from years and years and years of slavery. He has seen how God had done that by miraculous events. But yet something in Moses cried out to God, God, I want to know you on a more deeper, intimate level. And the Bible tells us that God spoke to Moses as a friend, face to face. It doesn't mean that he saw the face of God. God says, no man has seen my face and, and lived. But what it means is that they had such an intimate relationship with one another. What it means is that, they, that, that Moses knew God on a deeper level than others. And 
we have that access to God. You and I have that ability to come before God in faith and to experience Him and to know Him on a deeper, more personal level, level than we did yesterday. But it takes the same heart, the same willingness to approach God and to cry out to God, God, I want you. I want to know you on a more deeper level. And that ought to be all of our heart's desire as followers of Jesus Christ, is to know God. Not just to have a knowledge. It's not enough just to have a knowledge of God. God wants us to know Him. It says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And this word Lord in its original translation comes from Jehovah. The word Jehovah. And it means eternal or existing one. And what it's speaking of is the eternal God, the ever existing one. Uh, it, this is the proper name for God that was used by Israel to describe God. In fact, it was such a sacred name that they were, they were afraid to even speak it out loud. This is describing God's very nature and character. And He is revealing Himself to Moses in this sense that He was revealing to Moses His very nature and character. It goes on to say in verse 6, it says, And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed, The Lord... The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. You know, there are many who have a misconception of uh, a wrong understanding of God in the sense that they think that there's a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. Like somehow, with somewhere in between, God just changed. And I tell you that there is no God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament it's just God. God is, is, is never changing. That's why James wrote in James 1 that there's no shadow of turning in Him. In other words, God's not evolving. He's not changing. We often have this idea of the Old Testament as being, you know, the, the Old Testament God as being this, this harsh God who is just ready to punish and 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 and. and, and and in to bring about justice. And it is true, God is justice. But God is revealing His, His nature here to Moses in the sense that He is merciful. Meaning that He is full of compassion. I want to read to you a passage of Scripture out of Psalms. <clears throat> this is Psalm 78. Beginning with verse 36. And this is actually... The psalmist writing of the experience that Israel had with God as they journeyed through the wilderness. And in verse 36, it says, Never let, Nevertheless, they flattered him, talking about Israel, with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he. I've often heard people say, I'm thankful for the buts in the Scripture. Those moments when, when this is what we deserve, but God, right? God is faithful. God is just. God is merciful. This is but He being full of compassion. Aren't you thankful for the compassion that God has? And did not destroy them. Yes, many a time He turned His anger away. And that's true compassion in the sense of who God is when it speaks of His mercy. Because what it's speaking of when He talks about that God is a merciful God is, is saying that, listen, God is, does not give us what we have earned, what we deserve. In the sense, when we are repentant, we turn back to God. He gives us His grace and His mercy. And it says, And did not stir up all His wrath, for He remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away, and does not come again. God says to Moses, I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. This is who I am, Moses. And I'm a merciful God. Don't you think of the mercy of God? How many of us know and understand, right, that we don't deserve our salvation and our redemption? We don't. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that the heart is corrupt. It's deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. The only answer for the, des for the desperately wicked heart within man is Jesus Himself. And that's why it's by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. 
and not of works lest any man should boast. He's a merciful God, full of compassion, but he's also a gracious God. He's, he's, he's kind. He's a God who not only does not give us what we don't what we do deserve, but he gives us what we do not deserve. That's what grace is. That's what's a, that's what that means whenever it says here that he is a gracious God. You see, Israel deserved punishment. They deserved God removing his presence from them. But something turned that, <laughs> turned that situation around for them. Right? Where they were about to leave, go on to Mount uh, to the to the promised land, the land of Canaan. Without God, their hearts cry to God, crying out to God, God, we, we, we don't want to go if you don't want to go. Their repentance, their turning back to God, reconnected that, that, that connection that they were about to lose. God is merciful, He's gracious, and He's long-suffering. Long-suffering meaning that, listen, He suffers long for us. He's patient with us. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter that God is not slack in His promises, but long-suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's long-suffering towards us. Are you thankful for God's long-suffering? Yeah. Come on, tell me now, how many of us test the patience of God sometimes, right? But He is long-suffering towards us. This is the character of the nature of God. This is the, the, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you, were to, if you were to look at how many times the Bible says that God is long-suffering in the Old Testament and look at it in the New Testament, you would see that it talks about God's long-suffering much in both the Old and the New because He is the unchanging God. He's not evolving. He's not changing. The Bible says that He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do we believe that? Let me ask you a question. Do circumstances in life change that reality? Does, does the condition of, of society around us, does, does that determine or change the character and the nature of God? No, what he's saying here is he's saying, I'm always gracious. I'm always merciful. I'm always long suffering. And he's also saying here, I'm abounding in goodness. Abounding means that, listen, overflowing, right? It's beyond, right, full. It's beyond that. It is overflowing. He's overflowing with goodness. And church, that means that, listen, in all of God's characteristics, uh, you know, we've been studying the names of God on Wednesday because the Lord has just impressed on my heart the importance that we, that we, that we have a good, proper understanding of God. And, and, and studying His names is, is, a, is a good way of doing that because His names in the, in the Bible that are given to God are a description to describe God, okay? To describe His characteristics, His nature. But He's abounding in goodness. He's abounding in church and mercy. He's abounding in grace. He's abounding in long-suffering. But church, He's also abounding in goodness in, 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 the, in the sense of He's a just and He's a holy God. We're going to see that here in just a minute. God is, is good in whatever He does. He's also abounding in truth. You know, Jesus says that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Is truth important, church? It doesn't seem to be important in our society today. There's so many who have embraced this false ideology that truth is relevant. That you can make your own truth, right? And that truth is whatever you want it to be. But yet the Word of God tells us that God is truth. Jesus says, I am truth. I am truth. The truth is important. To understand the heart, the nature, and the purpose of God in our life. And, and we can only do that through intimate time with, with the Lord and, and studying and reading His Word. Because His Word gives us direction and guidance. It lights our path for us. It leads us into a deeper knowledge and understanding of who God is as we seek His heart and His, and, and, and His will and purpose for our lives. And it's through time in, in prayer and in, in spending time praying to the Lord, speaking to the Lord, conversating with God, 
seeking Him. It's through fellowship, corporate worship. All of these are ways that we grow in a deeper intimacy with the Lord. You know, we're coming up on a new year. I know that there's a lot of people who want to make New Year's resolutions, right? How many times have you started the new year saying that I want to, I want to have a stronger faith or I want to have a stronger relationship with the Lord? Guilty. How many of you, a couple months into it, see you start slacking, right? Usually weeks. Weeks. <laughs> Doesn't take months, right, Dave? For many of us. You see, Moses wanted more. Moses knew that, listen, that the task at hand that he had to accomplish was impossible for him to do apart from God. So many of us don't view our lives in that way. So many of us think, man, we got this. I can do this on my own. And that's why it always takes a catastrophe sometimes to bring us back to God, doesn't it? It's that realization that, hey, no, I don't have control over this, and I need, I need the Lord's help. And that's, that's all part of God's long-suffering and patience with us, and His loving kindness, His mercy, and His graciousness to us, the church that we can return to Him. You know, John writes in 1 John chapter 1, right? John says that these things that we write to you, we write because we want you to have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. And he says that, that listen, if you if, if any of you sin, right, if you if if any of you fall into temptation and, and you and you and you separate in, in regards to your intimacy with the Lord in that moment, he says you can return by confession. Come before the Lord, confess your sins. He is faithful. He is just to forgive you and to cleanse you of your unrighteousness. See, that's the mercy, that's the kindness, the graciousness of God is that we can come before God and know that, listen, when we come in confession, He hears us and He forgives us of our sins and He cleanses us and He restores us into a right standing, a right relationship with the Lord. We need, we need grace, church. We need grace every day. But in verse 7, he says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgressions. Whew. And sin. By no means clearing the guilty. See, we've seen the graciousness. We've seen the mercy. We've seen the long-suffering and patience of God. We've seen that He is good. He is truth. And here we see He is also just. God's not going to let sin go without... Punishment. Thank, thankfully, He has put that punishment on Jesus for us. Jesus has borne our sins upon Himself and taken the, the debt that we owe upon Himself. But church, that doesn't mean that listen, sin is without consequence. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 that God chastens those with whom He loves. In fact, he's saying if you if you endure if you don't endure chastening by God, then you're in fact illegitimate. One of the ways that we know that we're a child of God is that when God disciplines us, when we feel and we know that the route that we're taking and the things that we're doing are against the will of God, and God convicts our heart through the indwelling Holy Spirit within every believer. What God is doing is saying, come to me in agreement. That's what confession means. That we confess our sins, we come in agreement with God, and when we do that, God forgives us. He cleanses us. He is a merciful, gracious, long-suffering God who is full of goodness, abounding in goodness and truth. And he's a just and holy God. And it says here, by no means clear in the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the children and, of, and the children's children to the third and the fourth generations. And I tell you that sin doesn't just affect you, but it affects all of those who are close and near to you. But listen, that pattern can be broken. 
that generational curse that has followed you and in, in your in your family for so many years can be broken whenever you bring it to the Lord and you and you accept the grace and mercy, the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus, and you allow Him to do the work necessary in your life to conform you to His image and to change you from the inside out, to redirect your path. Can I tell you that that moment, that time, can redirect the whole course of of your life and those who are dear and near to you. But then I love verse 8. It says in verse 8, it says, So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. You see, Moses had had experience with the, with the true God. He had had an experience with Jehovah, the eternal, the ever-existing God, the unchanging God. And he could do nothing more else but to bow down and worship. And so you can't have a true experience with the Lord without, without that recognition of His worthiness. His worthiness to be praised and to worship. Isaiah experienced that in his call to be a prophet of the Lord. Whenever God showed him this, this vision of God seated on His throne and how the train of God's throne uh, 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 robe filled the, the temple. And how there were seraphim that flew above Him with six wings. With, with two they flew. With two they covered their, <laughs> their, 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 their face. I mean, with two they covered their feet. With two they covered their eyes. And with two they flew. And in that experience, this vision that Isaiah saw of God seated on His throne, speaking of God's sovereignty and His rule over all creation, in that experience, in that moment, Isaiah cried out to God, Woe is me, for I am unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. But then it said that the angels flew and they grabbed a hot coal from the throne and they brought it to Isaiah and they stuck it on his lips and in that moment, his sins were forgiven. The mercy of God. But you see the recognition that Isaiah had in the presence of God I am unworthy. I am unworthy. That's the reality of our condition apart from God. Is that we're unworthy. But He is willing. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. We serve a good God. Amen? Amen. What's, what do you hear quoted often in, in churches? God is good. God is good. All the time, God is, good. God is good. Right? That's the true nature of God. That's who He is. God is good. All the time. Is there ever a time when God is not good? No. Now listen, there may be circumstances and situations in our, that arise in our life that may cause us to question that. But that does not determine or change the reality of the condition of, of who God is. That He is good. He is good. He is good all the time. Because all we can do is all we have, we're limited to the here and now. We see things partially, right? We see it in this, in this little um, viewing glass, right? But God sees the full picture. And that's why Paul could say with such confidence that God works all things out for the good of those who love Him or are called according to His purpose. It's because God sees the beginning. He sees the during. And He sees the after. He sees it all. And because He is good, because He is merciful, gracious, and long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, church, He will never fail you. And I want to make this applicable for us today. Church, I want this to be personal for you today. And I want you to know about the character and the nature of God. That because of this reality that He is Jehovah, He is Lord God, ever-existing God, all-knowing. The word there is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is also omnipresent. He is always there. And He's also omnipotent. He is all-powerful. That reality means the church, listen, if God is unchanging like we've learned today, if there, if God is, if God is not changing, then 
that means that the same God who has worked on your behalf in, in the past is the same God who will work for you in the present. The same God who delivered you in, in, the, in the past is the same God who will de deliver you today. Church, it takes us putting our faith and our trust and our hope in Him and our full of confidence and understanding that He's a God who does not change. He will never fail us. He will never disappoint. Verse 9, it says, Then He said, I, If I know, if I now have found grace in Your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquities and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. I wanted to read that part because I just wanted us to see the heart of, of Moses here. His understanding, his need for God. Do you need Him this morning? Every day. Every day. Let me tell it. Let me ask you: Are you tired and weary from from the struggle, from the trying to do things on your own strength and in your own might and your own will? Are you tired? Jesus says, "I am your Sabbath." Jesus says, "I am your rest." Jesus says, "Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest." He says, rest for your souls. That deepest, most innermost rest that just gives you rest, church, in knowing that you're in the presence of the one who is the possessor of your peace, your joy, your happiness. It's in Him. And He is unchanging, unmovable, unshakable. God does not change just because circumstances change in our life. God is God. He is always, these things, these descriptions that He's given to Moses, always merciful, always gracious, always long-suffering. He is always good. He is always true. Always. Amen? Amen. Would you please stand as we go in the invitation this morning.